Hey, what's up everybody? We want to welcome you to another episode of the Dreamers Pro Daily Recap, where we give you a recap of all of the hot topics that we covered that day. You can catch them in their long format and also catch it fully streaming for free on Apple Podcasts. Uh, Chris Carter's back um, making news. As you guys know, Chris Carter made a lot of news about a week or so ago uh, with some comments that he made that were centered on an exchange, a heated exchange that he had with Skip Bayless back on uh, First Take when he was on there before. He was on his podcast and they were discussing how Skip Bayless disrespects various people in sports. And he essentially spoke about a moment that he had with Skip uh, a number of years ago where they had to cut to the commercial break. When they got to the commercial break, he essentially stood up and told Skip Bayless, if you ever talk to me or disrespect me that way, I'm going to knock you upside the head. And then uh, he said it became an awkward moment. And then uh, that was that. So a lot of people were reacting to what he had to say uh, all over the Internet. Right. But then something interesting happened this morning. I was going through the Internet and I came across another segment or a brand new segment, rather, uh, of Chris Carter on his same show uh, talking about Skip Bayless. Now, let me give you guys the premise. So essentially what happened was apparently Skip Bayless responded to the comments that Chris Carter put out there. And Skip essentially said that he doesn't remember any of that happening the way that it did. So Chris Carter was now reacting to what Skip had to say. In the midst of him reacting to what Skip said in terms of his recollection of whether or not that incident ever occurred, he then got into Skip's career and he began to basically discuss some of the games that Skip began to play throughout his career career to really elevate himself. And he said one of his biggest moves was to criticize LeBron James uh, repeatedly, uh, in order to elevate his career to, to in, order, in order to take his career to the next level, uh, and he was essentially breaking it down in terms of how Skip Bayless went about doing that and the benefit that had on his career. So, what we'd like to do now is we'd like to play his comments. I want you guys to listen to it in its entirety, and then we're going to come back and react to his comments. Take a listen to Chris Carter talking about Skip Bayless here. Take a listen to that, and then when it just happened, LeBron James, the rise of LeBron James, and then him deciding that LeBron's not great, that LeBron's not clutch. So (laughs) he tried he's tried to shift gears a couple times. Now it's about the Cowboys and LeBron. Mm -hmm. Like the Cowboys are winning every year. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to go on the show, you got to talk about the Cowboys, even if they're in the news, not in the news. And you have to represent LeBron because Skip's going to be bashing LeBron. So he's going to come at him no matter what. Oh, that's what he's been so doing you, the last 10 years. That's it. Like LeBron, even when LeBron wins, he doesn't win the right way. It's like apologizing to your wife. So oh, it? you didn't do that the right way. You didn't say that the what's right way. What's his issue with LeBron? He tries to call himself a Jordan guy. And he's just got so many complaints about LeBron, how mm-hmm. LeBron does stuff, how LeBron has conducted his business that there's no way that he can feel that way about LeBron. Like, I just got done watching LeBron in the championship game, gold medal game. Right. What an amazing athlete. He's amazing, dude. I mean, he's so unselfish, rebounding, a triple-double in the mm-hmm. semifinals game. Mm-hmm. Like, so unselfish, guarding their best player. Mm-hmm. In clutch situation, he, he's guarding. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's guarding the joker. So, like – and has made a career out of doing it and been successful. Like, Plus, so, he's done it right. This is a dude that just doesn't – like. Never he's mentions it. Done it right. He never I mentions mean, Whether you like whatever That's you think – That's almost impossible. Like, to come in at that age with all his distractions yeah. and do everything he's done the way he's done it, right. on and off the court, he causes no problems, goes about his business, makes his money, hangs out with his family. Right. Whatever but he's made – <clears throat> Excuse me, but Skip's made a career – his second part of his career, because he's an old dude. Yeah, he is. Second part of his career, he's really made it off of bashing LeBron James. So you heard uh, what Chris Carter had to say there. I have a number of thoughts. Um, I want to discuss the part because actually later on he ended up saying that um, uh, uh, Stephen A. Smith gave him more credibility by having Stephen A. Smith on his show. 
but he was basically talking about how um there's no way this skip believed some of the things that he was saying about lebron james in terms of his you know critical comments on lebron on a consistent basis here's what i think as someone that was watching first take all the way going back to 2009 or something like that, 2007, 2008, and watching those shows, listening to Skip Bayless talk about LeBron James. I personally believe that Skip meant the things that he was saying about LeBron. I think that Skip viewed LeBron James as a player that had a lot of potential he knew there was a lot of hype surrounding him. Um, but I personally think that Skip didn't like LeBron James for a few reasons. Number one, I think Skip did never believe that, uh, believe that uh, LeBron James wasn't a classy person. And he said it. He said LeBron shows no class. Based off of what? Based off of his theatrics. For example, if you guys go back and watch LeBron James in 2006, 2007, um, he used to do a lot of things that was disrespectful to opponents. For example, his team would be up and you would see LeBron James dancing on the sideline. Dancing on the sideline while his team is playing. If his team is winning the game, he'll be dancing. He'll be flipping bottles. And Skip thought that that showed poor sportsmanship, like to be dancing on the sideline throughout a game. Um, he didn't like some of LeBron's antics in terms of like, for instance, when he lost in the NBA Finals. He came out there and basically told people, you know what, you guys can go back to your miserable lives. I'm going to be rich. Anyway, uh, he wore shirts like check my stats. Um, he also didn't like the fact that LeBron dared to feel like he could come after Michael Jordan as the greatest player of all time. But he didn't prove that he deserved to even be mentioned in the same breath with Jordan. There was a time when Stephen A. Smith got very, 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 very upset with LeBron on first take when he was a contributor and his issue with LeBron was LeBron wanted to be praised as a champion even though he didn't win anything he wanted to be celebrated even though there was nothing to celebrate these were some of the things that Skip these were some of the issues that Skip Bayless would have, have with LeBron but I also do believe that um, Skip also realized that it was helping his career because LeBron was being promoted as the face of the NBA. And here you have this guy in sports media with a bully pulpit, with a prominent show, morning sports talk show. And he's the main guy calling out LeBron James on a daily basis while you have everybody else in sports media basically twerking it up on a daily basis. So, of course, Skip Bayless stood out. And I also believe that Skip realized that this particular position that he consistently took on LeBron James was also going to help his career because he kind of became the anti-LeBron in media, right? So whenever you thought about Skip Bayless, you thought, of, you thought a range of things, but you also knew that he was a guy that didn't like LeBron James and it became part of his persona, right? And what would happen is during those old days you would have people come on the show just to debate skip on his lebron takes i remember celebrities all of these guys coming to push back on what lebron you know this and this and this because some of these people were supporters of lebron especially when he was with the miami heat i remember that i remember various guests coming on wale and all of these guys coming in to debate skip bayless right and i think it's just something that stuck with skip and it became part of his persona to the point where if he wasn't doing that people weren't listening to him now are there times when Skip Bayless went overboard with LeBron James and his critiques? Absolutely. But are there times when he told the truth? Absolutely. And there's another side to this, which is for as critical as Skip was of LeBron, you could make a legitimate argument that he was the only one in sports media that actually had the courage to be critical. Who else was critical of LeBron James in a, in a real way? Nobody. I can't think of anybody. The only person I can think of was Stephen A. Smith back then during that period on first take. Apart from that, now you may have Stephen A. Smith on occasion come out here and say one or two things, but for the most part, no one is. So Skip stands out 
for doing that and there are some people that respect him now should skip bayless have evolved and done other things probably so but i do think there's truth to what chris carter said but i don't believe that all of it was an act i do believe that skip bayless really meant those things that he said about lebron when he said he had no class he's not a jordan he's a fake jordan he shouldn't be mentioned in the same breath i think he really really genuine genuinely believe that as you guys know uh the olympics is over the usa was able to win the olympic gold versus france in a in a crazy game where stephen curry put on an all-time performance right it was it was it, it was absolutely incredible right with some of the shots that he was hitting towards the end of the game basically holding or keeping france at bay from being able to tie the game and possibly take the lead stephen curry uh was an integral part you know of usa capturing the gold medal so in the aftermath of that game various people in media were, were reacting to it people in the independent space people in big media and all of that but one of the shows that reacted to it uh i believe it was yesterday has stirred up quite a bit of controversy it was during a taping of get up uh in the morning and on the panel, as far as I can remember, or who was on the show, rather, I can remember was Kendrick Perkins and Mike Greenberg, right? You know, Mike Greenberg, he's always on uh, ESPN, been there for years. So essentially what happened was Mike Greenberg was setting up the question for Kendrick Perkins to kind of answer what he thought uh, about Stephen Curry's performance and where he thinks this kind of pushed Stephen for, uh, Curry in terms of his NBA career. But before he got to that, while he was setting up the question, he went on to say something that has a lot of people in the NBA community basically scratching our heads like, wait a minute, did, did Mike Greenberg just say this? Well, essentially what happened was, as he was setting up the question for Kendrick Perkins, he went out there and said, I think in the, what, 30 years or 40 years, whatever it is, he's been watching the NBA or well, 20, 30 years, he's been following the NBA that was the most historic moment in terms of shots that he has ever seen since he since he was covering the nba and a lot of us were like scooby what like what? what what did he just say so for those of you who didn't hear what mike greenberg had to say about stephen curry's performance and where he feels it ranks in the history of nba i want to play it for you now i want you guys to listen to it in its in its, in its entirety and i want to come back and react to his comments take a listen to mike greenberg here but for the guys who have titles, for someone like Steph, who this is the only thing missing from his resume, to have that moment, I believe it goes at the top of the list of his greatest moments, and I believe it is the most memorable sequence I've seen in basketball in my 50 years watching the sport. What do you think, Big Perk? Hey, Greeny, when was the last time I ever told you I was proud of you? Okay, that list was perfection. That looked like one of my lists. I mean, from top to bottom. <laughs> but when it comes down to Steph, hey, look, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. And those <laughs> last two games, especially the one to seal, the, to, to seal it all against France, listen, that's Steph Curry at his finest. And look, people could argue on another day what, he, what position he would go down as. I still have him as the greatest point guard ever, right? Greatest point guard ever. I understand he changed the game and how the game is played with him being the greatest shooter of all time. But the fact that he had LeBron James and Steph Curry wide open on the opposite wing and shot that basketball over two defenders to seal the deal with his classic epic night-night go-to-sleep type thing. Hey, look, I'll tell you this, Greeny. You're right. That was one of Steph Curry's greatest moments of his NBA career. Well, let's face it, in the entire history of the sport, he's the only person for whom that was a good shot, right? He's literally the only person that has ever lived for whom that was a good offensive sequence. Anyone else takes that shot, we are basically, uh, we're, we're, we're revoking their citizenship, right, for taking that shot at the end of an Olympic game. For Steph, that's a good look. Because if he is within 50 feet of the basket, he is a threat. And again, D. Wood, I would suggest that the circumstances were that meaningful because the Olympic gold didn't use to matter when it was so easy, when it was so obvious, such a foregone conclusion that we should have mm -hmm. it. That is no longer the case. 
Serbia absolutely could have beaten us. They played us dead even. France absolutely could have beaten us. They had guys who played out of their minds because of the circumstances. That game was not, and anyone who watched it, you don't need me to tell you this, was not a foregone conclusion. The consequences of losing are epic. They are enormous. And Steph Curry refused to let it happen. Yeah. D-Wood, your thoughts? So you heard what Mike Greenberg had to say there, right? When he said that, I believe it was yesterday, I don't know what caused us not to actually put out a show today, but today, and I got to give credit where it's due, I came across a segment from Sports and Fitness Rants where he was talking about that. I was like, man, this, this is a good point. Um, this is a good point. Let me, let me go ahead and talk about this as well. I have no problem giving credit where whenever I get inspiration from various channels, it happens all the time. Sports and Fitness Rants is, is one person, uh, two raw for sports. He's definitely somebody else that um, these guys inspire me in terms of the topic, some of the things that they say, how they say it, uh, especially with uh, sports and fitness rants. He says something about me having LeBron in my top five, and he began to say some things that really had to make me start thinking about, you know, why I had LeBron in my top five. And he brought up some fantastic points that made me reevaluate my position on that. So these guys put out some good content, thoughtful content as well. Um, anyway, so I began to think about it and I said, you know what? Let's try to make this a little bit scientific. So before producing this show, we actually put up a poll uh, on our channel to get a sense of what the audience thinks about all of this. So I want to show you the poll. We essentially asked the question about an hour or so ago. Please make sure you guys go ahead and vote and leave a comment because uh, we appreciate your feedback. But anyway, uh, the question was, what's the greatest shot in NBA history? And in about an hour of the poll being out, we have about a 1,700 voters by the time the show comes out, it should be more than that. So we put up five options. YouTube only allows you to put up five options. So first option was Jordan game six versus the Jazz NBA Finals. We have Kyrie Irving game seven, uh, 2016 versus the Warriors NBA Finals. Uh, we have Magic Johnson, Sky Hook, 87 versus the Celtics NBA Finals. Ray Allen shot. Game six, 2013 versus Spurs, NBA Finals. And we have Jordan, game one, buzzer beater versus the Jazz, 1997, NBA Finals. Now, if you notice something about this, this particular poll has everything to do with finals games because that's the biggest stage. There have been some other big shots that have been made throughout the playoffs, various buzzer beaters. Kobe hit one, LeBron hit a few, Kawhi Leonard hit another one, Damian Lillard hit another one. We decided to keep those out because they were not in the NBA Finals. So, all of these shots are in the NBA Finals. Just wanted to mention that. So out of, out of the 1,700 voters, 59% of them voted for Michael Jordan's shot versus the Jazz in the NBA Finals in Game 6. 14% voted for Kyrie Irving's shot in Game 7 to win the championship against the Golden State Warriors. We have Ray Allen's shot. They got 13, excuse me, 19% Magic Johnson sky hook versus the uh, in the 87 versus the Celtics. I got 5% in Jordan game one, game one buzzer beater versus the Jazz in 1997, right? So as I was going through the comments of what people were saying, a lot of people out there were basically saying two things. They were saying that uh, it should be Ray Allen shot, which was a big one. Uh, and it should be Kyrie Irving shot, right? Because after that, it, I mean, uh, meaning if you hit, if you miss those shots, series is over, you lose, right? In the case of Ray Allen, they would have lost. In the case of Kyrie, uh, game seven shot, if they miss that shot, they lose to the Warriors, right? And I think those are good points. I think those are good points. I think those are fair points. The reason I think that Jordan is receiving the majority of the votes regardless of the fact that, okay, Michael Jordan is viewed as the greatest player of all time. I think the reason people are voting for Jordan is this, is because of what was at stake, right? Jordan had announced that that was going to be his last year in the NBA. He was going to be retiring. He was coming off the heels of winning two championships back to back right two championships and now he was in a situation in which the world knew that this iteration of the chicago bulls with phil jackson dennis rodman scotty pippen michael jordan steve kerr and all these guys this was it this was it so after this year we will never see michael jordan ever again play basketball 
And at that point, he was already considered to be the greatest basketball player ever, 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 ever. You have a scenario in which that year, it was MJ's last season. That year, he led the league in scoring. He made the all first defensive team. And he was in the playoffs in quest of his sixth ring. This six ring would also separate him from players like Magic Johnson, who he was tied with at the time with five rings. And Jordan goes into that game seven, game six, excuse me. Knowing that Scottie Pippen was dealing with a significant injury. He was dealing with a back injury. None of those players I just mentioned in terms of the top, in terms of the top dogs in either of those series, the Celtics, excuse me, the, 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 the Cavs Warriors series, nor the, the, the Heat uh, uh, he, uh, um, Spurs series, all of the key players were healthy and available. In the case of the Chicago Bulls, if they lost that game, chances are they could have gone on to lose game seven. Why? Because Scottie Pippen couldn't even play. He couldn't even run up the floor. So it was carpe diem. Jordan had to seize the moment. And what people don't realize is not only is that the greatest shot in NBA history, it's the greatest sequence in NBA history. Because in that particular moment, Jordan exhibited his brilliance of what makes him who he is. His determination, his grit, his no give up attitude, and the fact that he's an assassin. Jordan, in that sequence, stripped Karl Malone, coming from the weak side, stripped him, comes up the court. The Bulls elect not to call a timeout so that uh, so the Jazz will set their defense. Jordan times the shot, times it, times it. Then he goes to make a move, crosses over, and pulls up to shoot his iconic jump shot. The man hit the jump shot with his iconic follow through, not only to win the NBA championship against a team they'd beaten the year prior, but also to go out as a with his career because he wasn't coming back after that. Kyrie, Ray Allen, all of those guys, those missed, they missed those shots. They can come back the next year. Jordan isn't coming back the next year. It's over. And for him to hit that shot. In that moment, and that's how he closed out his NBA basketball career. Kobe closed out on 60. Jordan closed out in a game winning, at the time at least, in a game winning shot to win his sixth championship. I think the voters got it right. It was Michael Jordan, and it's not even close. It's not even close because one person was concluding their career. All those other guys were still going. So to me, look, I think the voters got it right. In terms of Mike, Mike, uh, Mike Greenberg, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. He became a prisoner of the moment. I don't know what the hell he was talking about. And a lot of people are basically saying the same thing. So, so as you guys know, Skip Bayless is no longer at Undisputed, right? We had read some reports about a week or so ago hearing that Undisputed was supposed to be, supposed to be coming back this week after they fired Skip Bayless after him being with the, at the network for eight years. Uh, and what's interesting is that since Skip's departure from Undisputed, uh, I've been seeing him, seeing him a lot more on Twitter. He posts on Twitter every day regularly, right? Regularly. Skip Bayless is posting on Twitter, so he's remaining active and trying to remain relevant uh, in the sports media space. So what happened this morning, uh, I was doing some research and I came across an interesting article here from awfulannouncing.com. Uh, and the article had basically this following headline that I want to read to you guys. It says, Danny Parkins and Emmanuel Acho to reportedly join FS1's morning lineup, Undisputed will not return. And I was like, wait, 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 what? Undisputed ain't returning? So what happens with Keyshawn Johnson and all these guys? I was like, wow, okay, this is a... 
this is some pretty, pretty interesting news here that I think the audience is going to be interested in. Okay, let me get into what this article said uh, here. It says, as FS1 enters its post Gabalis era, the future of the network's programming is beginning to take shape. According to Chicago Sun's Time, 670 to scores Danny Parkins is set to join a new show in FS1's morning lineup this fall. Br uh, Barrett Media's Derek Furterman confirmed Parkins' move to the national stage and reports that Emmanuel Acho will also be joining FS1's morning lineups after most recently co-hosting FS1's afternoon program, Speak with Joy Taylor and LaShawn McCoy. Furterman also added that Bayless's former show, Undisputed, which hasn't been on air since Bayless's unceremonious, unceremonious final show on August uh, 2nd, will not return. Awful announcing has reached out to Fox Sports uh, regarding the reported moves, but yet it has yet to receive a response. The impending addition of Parkins to, the, to FS1's lineup hardly comes as a surprise as the network had reportedly been eyeing the 37-year-old Chicago sports talk host. Parkins has been recently host has recently hosted some FS1 shows, including The Herd. And while details regarding his show remain unclear, it makes sense that FS1 would pivot to a less hot takey host post Bayless. And then continues on. It's also unclear whether Acho will be a part of Parkins' new show uh, or his own vehicle, but it's similarly unsurprising that FS1 would lean on his star power post Bayless. While he's certainly a polarizing presence, the former NFL linebacker is one of FS1's most established names, and for better or for worse, he knows how to play the game. As for the apparent cancellation of Undisputed, an argument could be made that the show built enough brand equity, especially when Shannon Sharp is one of his co-hosts, that would have been worth continuing with a new host in Bayless's place. Ultimately, however, enough damage has been done over the past year that is more than understandable that FS1 will be looking for a fresh uh, start. So what are my thoughts about this? Actually, I think that's good. I think it's good. I think um, Undisputed had become stale. Right. I think it had become stale. They tried to have a new play on. They, they, they had a new name. Essentially, the first one was called Skip and Shannon's Undisputed. And then when Shannon Sharp left, it was just Undisputed. And we're like, OK, so now that Skip Bayless is no longer there, I think it makes sense for the network to just basically scrap that name uh, and that show altogether. Look, folks, the fact of the matter is Undisputed was never the same the moment Shannon Sharp was let go. I mean, that's just the reality. It was never, never the same. And to try to hold on to whole old glory with a new set of characters, it just wasn't going to work. If I'm being honest, the entire ensemble that they put forward on television every morning could not amount to Shannon Sharp. It's just the truth. Like, let's just be honest, right? Let's just be honest. Shannon Sharp is a one of one talent. It's, I mean, it's just the truth. Whether you like him or hate him, that those are the bloody facts. He's a one-on-one -on -one talent, uh, and he has proved that in two ways. Number one, by what he's been able to do at ESPN and what he's been able to do in the independent spec uh, sector with his own shows, and also what took place in the aftermath of his departure from FS1. I mean, it was an it was an utter disaster in terms of their ratings. They were struggling, and every single week it seemed like they were shuffling new people. And and then, and then you tune in, and to me, the reason reason why I think it also hurt them by bringing all those people is because there was no consistency. There were certain issues where you would be looking to hear from a particular person to hear what they thought, and then they bring in somebody else, and you're like, "But this is the wrong person to be discussing this this topic." And they did that all too often, right? They did it all too often. At the time, I had lobbied, lobbied, like I said, I, my people to lobby. I had said that, you know, Max Kellerman would have been a good replacement, but obviously they want to go in a new direction, maybe with someone younger. I haven't heard much of him, uh, Danny uh, Parkins. I'm, I'm sure we're going to be hearing a lot more from him coming in the future. I wish him all the best. I hope that he does a fantastic job uh, at the show. Um, but it seems like Undisputed is, is over. In terms of Emmanuel Acho, as the article alluded, uh, he can be a polarizing figure based on some of the things that he said i've heard i've, I've heard various situations where emmanuel Ach, emmanuel Acho has gotten himself in a sticky situation with various people sports media personalities like ryan clark uh, uh matt barnes uh and a few others based off of some of the things that he says obviously the network must be aware of this but also emmanuel Acho is a very sharp guy as the article said he's been doing this for quite some time and he knows how to play the game obviously he has a football background 
given the fact that he was a football player. So I think they know what they're doing. And I think we just have to wait and see ultimately uh, where all of this is leading to.